This is Dr. Paul Tomlinson from Compass Health Network, and I'm doing a continuing series aimed at inspiring hope and promoting wellness, the very mission of Compass, with the goal of helping us all get through these times we're living in and living through with grace and humanity. This is part two of a series called As If Back to School Wasn't Stressful Enough, New Realities, New Stressors, and Strategies for How to Deal. Here I want to talk about calming strategies. And by the way, what I will discuss here I've adapted from evidence-based recommendations from both the American Psychological Association and the National Association of School Psychologists. As I alluded to in part one, we know that some kids, like some adults, are more prone to anxiety than others. But most are experiencing some worries these days, and for some they may be extreme. You may see anxiety showing up in unexpected ways, including anger or outbursts like you haven't seen before. So what can you do to help? A set of skills we all need in our toolbox is calming strategies that work for us. We may need them at times as much or more than our children. These may sound contrived, and so they are. They're designed to be disruptive, to work to disrupt the emotional hijacking of our brains by overwhelming stress and anxiety. So try some of these strategies with yourself and with your kids. First one is simply slow counting. Now with younger children, you simply count from one to 10. Or with kids who are a little older, maybe count down from 10 to one. Or with teenagers, perhaps try slowly counting back from 100 by sevens. Slow and easy does it. And if your teenager gets stressed out by the math, just revert to the simple countdown. The next strategy is muscle tension and relaxation. Now this is a technique that has a long history and a lot of good research to recommend it. There are many different ways to do this, but here's the basic gist of it. Starting with the top of your head and working your, working your way all the way down to your toes, begin to tighten each muscle group or area, for example, with the forehead, and hold for a count of three seconds. Then relax it before moving to the next muscle group down. Facial muscles, cheek, neck, shoulders, chest, etc. All the way down to your toes. After each tense and release, try to focus on how it feels. The sensation, the difference between tense and relaxed. This can help all of the muscle groups descend into a deeper state of relaxation overall. And by the way, remind yourself and your child to only tense lightly, not to maximum effort where they're shaking from the tension. Next is slow breathing. Okay, breathing, really? Yes. I'm constantly amazed at how easy it is to forget how to breathe, or at how many people have never really learned how to do so in a way that serves them well. Teaching ourselves and our kids how to breathe therapeutically is one of the simplest and best things we can do for the sake of physical and emotional health, especially in times of distress. So the basic drill is, you can take very slow breaths, deep breaths, in through your nose for a few seconds. I actually like to go for a count of seven, but you do what works for you to get a deep fill of air into your lungs. You can add other imagery if you want. Pretend you're breathing in the smell of your favorite flowers or the fresh mountain air or pizza if you want. And you may also add a powerful visualization or words to the effect of, I am breathing in health and peace and calm or whatever works for you. And hold that breath for at least two to three seconds. Then slowly release, let that breath out. And here you might engage the thought, if it's helpful, I'm breathing out distress, worry, anxiety. Upon breathing out, it can be fun for a child to imagine slowly moving a feather across the desk with their breath, for example, a sense of efficacy. Be sure to repeat this process as many times as you find helpful in getting centered, maybe five to seven times at least. Next, mindfulness. Now, you've seen a bazillion books on this. It's all the rage, and you see and hear it nearly everywhere. It can be easy to lose the simplicity and power of mindfulness in all the hullabaloo surrounding it. The way I like to think of mindfulness is simply learning to live in the moment, to focus on the present. So, some simple and powerful things you can do 
are to have kids focus on what they see, hear, smell, touch, and even taste right then, right now. You see, the nature of anxiety is that it pulls us to live in the future, in some vaguely or specifically imagined negative or painful state. So the magic of mindfulness is that we use it to take the claws out of anxiety by focusing on what's right here, right now. It's true of adults for sure, but kids especially may need sometimes a little help in order to focus on what's happening right now, rather than thinking about the scary boogeyman, the what-ifs, and the future. Another one of my favorite mindful centering techniques is sometimes called five blue things. When you ask yourself or your child, find five blue things in the room. It literally forces us to focus on what's in front of us, what's all around us. Of course, be careful not to ramp up anxiety by, you know, using the color blue if there's nothing blue in the room. That can be bad. It can be orange, red, brown, whatever the target-rich environment is. You get the idea. Next, positive self-talk. Oh boy. Those of us who remember the Stuart Smalley character from Saturday Night Live may have a bad taste in our mouth about positive self-talk. Kind of like what Stuart called daily affirmations. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. But let's not throw the baby out with the sketch comedy. Positive self-talk is incredibly important, especially when you begin to take an inventory of the kind of self-talk we often have running through our heads all day, every day. And by the way, self-talk is another word for thinking in many ways. It's the messages we send ourselves daily, many times an hour, many times a minute. We send ourselves a lot of messages. And once we begin to take stock of them, which we can do by writing them down, by saying them out, saying them out loud to a trusted friend, etc., we may learn that they are heavily focused on negative or even catastrophic things. So the simplest approach is to begin to focus on what can be controlled, what is under our control. If we become aware that we are in a period where routine is no longer providing the structured time we need, and that sets us adrift a bit, the positive self-talk antidote could be, well, maybe now I have some time to do some of that artwork I've been wanting to do, these projects I've been wanting to get to that make me feel good and empowered and alive. Or if a child seems to be fixated on the COVID world and all its uncertainties, Help them reframe their thoughts to the tune of, okay, there are a lot of adults working on stopping this virus and dealing with it. So that leaves me available. I can just do my schoolwork and have some fun. Those are my jobs as a kid, schoolwork and having fun. So there are a few time-honored and effective calming strategies for you to use with yourself and or your students. I want to share a few other thoughts to close. Make sure you do all you can to keep the lines of communication open with your child and do your best to non-judgmentally accept all the feelings they share, even if they don't make sense to you or even if they worry you. In the spirit of doing what we can, changing that which is under our control, it may be helpful to reframe everything we and they are doing during this pandemic. Explain to your child that staying home and the often drastic change in daily activities is actually doing something to combat COVID-19. This may help them to feel as if they're part of the solution. It may help give them meaning in their adversity, which we know is very important, right? If we know why, we can often endure almost any how. In future episodes, I'll talk more about responding to students in crisis and strategies for building resilience, among other things. In closing, if your child is having persistent anxiety, sadness, irritability, or other symptoms of stress, change in behavior, sleep, or appetite changes, that don't respond to the kind of strategies I've been discussing here, it might be time to consider seeking professional services to help your child navigate through this difficult time. Of course, if you're in Compass Health Network service area, we would be very happy to help. And if you're not, we're happy to help you connect one of our wonderful sister agencies where you live, if possible. Even though we're necessarily physically distant, even though we do it from behind masks or on a, a tablet or computer, 
help is available.